The zombie represents our unlived life, but we're not doing it. And the fear we feel, therefore, then, is a representation of the actual fear that we feel due to complexes, pardon me, maladaptations in the unconscious to do with living a, a proper life. There are no undead, there aren't, but there are plenty of people who aren't living properly. Mm -hmm. And that's hugely important to understand, and also why this mainly affects young people. And when a person feels instinctive pressure fired at them to do something and is then exposed to the idea of zombies in the culture, the deep structure complex takes on the face of a zombie. Because the role of the deep structure complex is to reflect back to the ego, this is what we think, that is to say, the meta instincts in the genome, what we think of you. And what we think of you is how you present to us. You're in that much of a mess, that much of a state. And that then can help to inform dreams and why people may dream about them. And then the deep structure complex becomes the focus and the portal for meta instinctive pressure to pass through. Hi everyone. A quick note before we launch into today's video. Applications for CADA 5 of our IPSA professional training course are now open for start in September 2022. If you feel that you have a calling towards depth psychology or psychotherapy and would like to train professionally under Steve and Pauline Richards in psychosystems analysis, then you are more than welcome to apply. We really look forward to reading your application. Check the link in the description and pinned comment for the application webpage. Thanks everyone. Now, on to the video. Hello Steve, you alright? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you James, and uh, thank you for presenting this very interesting question. It's something that uh, we've experienced in our clinical work for probably 25 years. It goes back at least that far that this particular topic has been rising itself up from the dead, shall we say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so someone asked a question, it was a few days ago, wasn't it, on our Discord server, and it turned into a 1,000 word response from yourself spread over several posts You're working incredibly hard on discord over the last look, look while so thank you for very that enjoyable though. very very enjoyable yeah so yeah as you say we thought it'd be a good idea to go through for a video so without any further ado i guess the question goes in the current culture there seems to be a collective resonance with the idea of zombies over the past 20 years there have been massive amounts of movies novels video games etc revolving around the zombie motif Anyone have any thoughts on the psychological significance and interpretation of this modern myth? I think it's really important when we're confronted with something that's at such a high resolution culturally in terms of images to actually work through what's going on, because what appears to be going on, what's really going on, where the unconscious is concerned, are, are often at variance. And it's for this reason, principally, that the unconscious does not communicate in the same language that normal consciousness does. That's pretty much mistake 101 or at least 102, if not 101, because the psyche is what it is. The ego, the ego, conscious personality is what it is, and they communicate according to what their task is at any one time. So the unconscious will communicate in terms which sometimes are more like a pun on the ego's position, uh, which could be interpreted as being compensatory. Youngins typically do that. But very often you don't get a direct verbal representation from the unconscious for about what it really means or what it represents. But what you often get is a narrative. And the narrative will be expressed through a dream, um, for example, through spontaneous imagery that emerges from within when we're conscious. Uh, and also in cultural media representations. And it's a well-known fact, I know you know this, that from your own work and your own personal development experience, that the quickest way of getting inside somebody's unconscious mind is to get inside what we could broadly call their fantasies. And the last video we did covered the difference between fantasy and imagination. The real import of this is that fantasies provide inertia for progression in the psyche. In other words, everything starts to slow down and coalesce around the fantasy and the ego gets fascinated by it and then goes into repetition compulsion. It's almost a kind of addiction. So within that repetition compulsion, then we actually get both the problem and the solution 
presenting simultaneously, but they're not clearly differentiated out. So it can appear then that we understand what the situation is, but we don't because we interpret it as the ego interpreting the unconscious. And this is really marked here in this case, when we look at the phenomenon of zombies. And uh, the way I phrased the, the opening for the discussion on Discord on this topic was to prompt people to begin to think differently about how they approach the psyche. In other words, don't take your normal external way of relating to the outer world with you when you go in on the inside. It's not the way to do it. Okay, so um, what I said here then is, what is it that in the lives of those drawn to that narrative and that image, which has never lived, not so much undead as unlived, the psyche tells us what it is, but often on its own terms, rather than how the ego may fantasize about it. The result is that we see things, or see such things as compensation, puns, or deliberate misleading by the shadow, when it's far more likely to be simply a statement of position by the psyche that represents what we don't know consciously. This symbolization can be a precursor or a concomitant to other things which would be instinctive or psychodynamic, that are the real compensation, that is to say homeostatic pressure. If that fails, then we can expect downstream effects such as the trickster function or movement of libido into, for example, anxiety or depression. So I'll just pause there, James, and see if there's any feedback you think would be important on that before we mm. carry on. Yeah, I imagine a question that would come up straight away would be, uh, based on what you said there a moment ago, is the word undead, how it was produced by the culture spontaneously, whenever it was, and then was agreed upon by large numbers of people? Because it's rather an, an unusual word being undead. It's, it's funny, it's sort of in, innately in that way. Was that, do you think that that was then um, produced by the unconscious of an individual resonant with the collective as a pun for unlived? Yeah, definitely. Uh, immediately you change that from undead into unlived, then you can see homeostasis at work. If we run with the idea of being undead, then we shift our focus immediately into something completely different. And what's mobilized then will be Panksepian instincts for fear, for example. Whereas to be unlived is far more positive. And as a general rule of thumb, the homeostasis acts to help us to survive rather than to drive our, our, us into a state of premature thanatos and death. So the idea of undead really should be read as being unlived. What is it about the psyche, the personality, the through line of an individual that has been unlived and is represented in this form in order to shock us into attention? And of course, the ego being the way that it is, will take it far too literally rather than symbolically. And oh, it's undead. No, it's unlived. And that's what you're feeling, instinctive pressure of an unlived life which then surfaces as a compensatory um, symbol that suggests this, that suggests undead, the undead are coming for you. No, no, your unlived life is coming for you. And if you don't assimilate that, and if you don't work it through properly, then you will fall into a state of anxiety or depression or stasis, all of which taken together can be aspects of appearing to be a zombie and undead. But no, it's not, it's unlived. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So someone will have an interest or if someone does have an interest in, say, a zombie film or zombies as a, say, a collective fandom, that, that's um, from at the outside looking in, that's a libido pull towards a fantasy. Yeah. What, what you seem to have suggested here is that the, the fantasy in and of itself, and this is based on the last video as well that we recorded, of, of course, on imagination versus fantasy. It's not innately pathological, but the libido is going there for a particular reason. When you said that uh, we can expect downstream effects, such as the trickster function or movement of libido into anxiety or depression, does that result from sort of like a chronological order, not interpreting what the, or the reason why the libido is drawn to that imago in the first place? Yes, and basically misinterpreting the symbol, taking it too literally. There can be no compensation from a symbol which is literal. It has to be different than the conscious attitude, the conscious attitude of adjustment. So this, this is the paradox, the apparent paradox, but it's only so to, from the perspective of the ego. 
if you take the perspective of the unconscious, the non-ego psyche, then it makes sense. The compensation takes that form because it's trying to shock a person out of a state prodromally, that is to say upstream of these things going really wrong for them, to shock them out of that state of adaptation and say, I don't want to be like an undead living person. What does it mean? And as we said last time, there's the affect, but what does it mean? If the affect is fear, what is the meaning of fear? And Jung himself said, for example, that at bottom, a fear of death is a fear of life. And that supports this view. That the fear of the undead is a, is a fear of living mm -hmm. and adapting and a necessity to do so. So the unconscious does what it does best. It comes up with symbols which are intended to shock us into a homeostatic adjustment. But if the ego instead generates a fantasy about that, which it then indulges in a repetition compulsion way, then we are definitely storing up problems downstream because that instinctive pressure will not go away. It will organize itself and it will start to appear anxiety, depression, or even the trickster. <laughs> it makes sense as well with most zombie stories that I'm aware of. I'm not super familiar with the genre, to be honest, but I think it's universal that if the zombie catches you and bites you, you become a zombie yourself. And I guess that's that's part of the image that you're or the part of the riddle that you're saying is innate to this image. If you're caught by the thing, you turn into the thing. Therefore, there's an, an innate fear of becoming like the thing, as you said. Yeah, but if you misunderstand the story, but if, but if we misunderstand what the thing is, then our fear, which is the fear of being bitten, and the Panksepian fear system, which is expressing itself to shock us into analyzing what's emerging from the unconscious. Well, that gives you all the information that you need really to understand. Mm -hmm. We actually should turn into what the zombie represents because the, the zombie represents our unlived life, but we're not doing it. And the fear we feel, therefore, then is a representation of the actual fear that we feel due to complexes, pardon me, maladaptations in the unconscious to do with living a, a proper life. There are no undead, there aren't, but there are plenty of people who aren't living properly. Mm -hmm. And that's hugely important to understand and also why this mainly affects young people. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Good clue, because it's, it's to do with adaptation to lifespan development transitional phases. Right, so innate potential that remains repressed is in effect undead. And this is along the lines of what I've just said, but it's not inert. It has an informational presence but it's not superpositioned into relationship to the ego yet. The ego is unaware of it or it is repressing it. That's the problem. Uh, not superpositioned into relationship to the ego and action in the world. Instinctive pressure pushes into symbolic representation. The imago of a deep structure complex, bracket a resultant image that is alive in the genome and the instincts, but repressed for the good or the bad of it. The summation of this can be the zombie phenomenon as a collective representation of a field-wide inner human situation. The imago is unlikely to change until it is superpositioned into conscious ego relationship, at which point it can transform and unpack its meaning into an individual self-concept. There's a lot in there, but there's an awful lot that's very, very useful psychodynamically and in terms of personal development. Oh, there is there's a huge amount so if we if we yeah if we go to the part about deep structure complex then if someone has a has a very strong interest in zombie movies or zombie books or if they dream a lot about a zombie image is that then likely to be a deep structure complex rather than a genean complex it won't start off as one and this is a really important point because the way deep structure complexes form is that they're janus faced so on, on the one hand, you have that which is pointing basically towards the ego and receives an imprint of the ego's action in the world. So that side of the deep structure complex is acquired. On the obverse side of that, there is the solution to the issue that the ego is not adjusting to. And so that is literally in opposition to it, but they're, they're contained together. Now, the solution to that polarity is in the messer instinct, which lies behind it. So what you will have then is that somebody starts off and then there's a prodromal process that won't be noticed, it won't be conscious, 
where a person is failing to adapt incrementally to something. Gradually, then the deep structure complex takes on the form of that. And when a person feels instinctive pressure fired at them to do something and is then exposed to the idea of zombies in the culture, the deep structure complex takes on the face of a zombie. Because the role of the deep structure complex is to reflect back to the ego. This is what we think, that is to say, the meta instincts in the genome is what we think of you. And what we think of you is how you present to us. You're in that much of a mess, that much of a state. And that then can help to inform dreams and why people may dream about them. And then the deep structure complex becomes the focus and the portal for meta instinctive pressure to pass through. So this ties into when you mentioned in a previous video about the deep structure complex being the port reeve or that gatekeeper type yeah. figure. So, so, so and mention that because it seems to tie into the zombie imago in this case being posed as a riddle. So the deep structure complex poses a riddle to say, can you solve this? Not yeah. to mythologize, but is that the general idea? Yes. If, if we mythologize things, um, what we do is we, we internalize another layer of experience. So something from the culture then is, is taken in and that feeds the deep structure complex, which will receive it because the act of internalizing a collective myth and making it a personal myth on the inside is compensated for by the deep structure complex, which says this is what you're doing to yourself. And that's, that's something which people have difficulty understanding, but it's really fundamental and simple because it's part of the homeostatic process. Mm -hmm. It's not as if a deep structure complex is a little wise old man that runs around on the inside and dispenses wisdom. It doesn't happen like that. The first thing that we're going to, we're going to meet that's of any substance at all before we get into the meta instincts is our deep structure complexes, which reflect our state of adaptation consciously. That's the first face we see. Behind that, though, is that which is necessary to bring about a correction for it. But you have to meet the impression of yourself first. And the reason that that works is because the ego does internally project anyway. This is a huge problem that we have uh, in exploring the psyche is that we insist on making the outside world the model of the inner world. So we internally project psychosocial relationships. We expect to see it populated with little people. So we do. We, we get an impression of ourself reflected back to us, which is the attempt at rapport, if you like, from the unconscious to the conscious mind but it does it in its own way. And it says, this is what you are to us. This is what you're doing. How we then interpret that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. If we misinterpret it, we reinforce the error. We over amplify the error. And then the unconscious will respond in the only way that it can. It will do that through psychodynamics, through projection, identification, transference at one level out in the world. And on the inside, instinctive pressure will ramp up and start to create dreams and fantasies, which in essence are focused or channeled through deep structure complexes. Mm -hmm. And when, when they approach consciousness, they then kick off other kinds of, con of complex. Those that are, are more closely associated, associated with the ego, they cause perturbations in the field of consciousness within which these complexes are active. And that can cause other, all sorts of other problems as well, simply because we're not relating to ourselves in the right way. That makes a lot of sense. It's a, a lot of sense. So when the deep structure complex reflects back to the ego and, may, and says, this is what you're like, in this instance, then I don't want to get too hyper-specific, obviously, because it would differ from case to case. But is it saying it's not, so the deep structure complex is not saying you are a zombie. No, no. Saying you, you are as if you are running away from a zombie. It, 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 it's saying that you have acquired this from the culture and have identified with it. This is what you are doing to yourself. Now, if you feel the fear of that from within, that is not saying this is what you are. In truth, it's saying this is what you shouldn't be. And this is a problem. And that you need to see what you're doing to yourself. You need to become conscious of yourself outside of those ego identified complexes, which are more superficial. The ones I mentioned before, that are within the field of consciousness, but identified ones specifically are those that we do literally identify with. And, and then the, the inner world is compensating, saying, this is what, this is what you've done to yourself. Isn't it stupid? Mm -hmm. This is why you're receiving instinctive pressure. Now your task is to understand that. And you need to approach the deep structure complex. As you approach it, the opportunity will arise 
for it to change because the active approach will reflect the way in which you approach it. So those often sadly Jungians who then take the psychological theory in with them and face the unconscious simply generate an amplification of their ego position as a reflection back. It's a narcissistic thing. You could say that's probably where the myth of narcissus comes from. You stare into the pool of the unconscious, you see your own reflection rather than what's actually there. And that's the problem. Okay. Because people who follow Jung expect a wise old man or a similar figure to be in there to solve all their problems, which is a parental issue. It's a parental transference going inwardly from the ego to say, sort this out for me. Tell me that you know, this is why people are vulnerable to internet gurus on the outside. They have an internal internet guru as well, which is a, a fallacy. It's a fake. It's not real. But it's an internal projection. And they expect the unconscious to work like that. Well, it doesn't. We have to approach it on its own terms. Perfect, perfect. So in terms of like a general workflow before moving, moving on, the uh, so someone's particular Genean complex setup will in increase the proclivity perhaps to internalize or identify with the imago of a zombie. So that's, 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 that's the first thing yes. really. And once that then is taken hold, then the deep structure complex takes that, mirrors it back to the ego and says, this, this is what you have internalized yeah. about yourself, solve yeah. it. And the Panksepian instincts then are launched through that and they hit us as fear. And we think we're afraid of the idea of becoming a zombie rather than it's no, you, you are focused too much on the idea, the cognitive idea, the learning psychosocial top-down idea of a zombie and are not living an adapted life. You need to be frightened about that. Mm -hmm. And in order to access those resources that are within, you need to, to go in. And as you go in, the face of the zombie, if you like, that is born by the, um, the deep structure complex will alter, will change more positively because you are making the effort to go in. When you run away from a zombie, it follows you. And that's exactly the kind of thing that will happen here. The deep structure complex will follow you. The notion of being bitten and turned into one is saying you need to receive this information in order to transform. There are no zombies. They're not real. The imago of them, though, if we treat it as real, means we do not understand it. By real, I mean external. It's a symbol. It means something else. And when people generate fear in response to internal images, they're not adapted either to the outside world or the inside world because they don't understand the rules of either. The outside world's full of real threats. The inside world's full of compensatory threats. We're dealing with a phylogenetic psyche, an ancient brain. It doesn't like to talk or speak or communicate in a fanciful way. But very often people who are into depth psychology and young want or expect it to do it, it it just doesn't that's the cluster that the ego acquires through learning and then insists on projecting internally so the real way of getting past this is to accept that the psyche is offering a solution but it's doing it by saying this is what you're doing to yourself and on the basis of rapport i show you what you are it feels so right what you're saying what you're saying People get well quickly when they follow this. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they're in Jungian analysis or Freudian analysis from anything from four to 15 years. Do people want to waste their life? Or do they want to treat the psyche as being something natural that actually wants you to be well? The psyche doesn't want you to suffer. That's contra naturum. It's against biology. It, 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 it makes no sense. So therefore, if we accept that the homeostasis is, is the governing principle, then anything we receive from within is an attempt at compensation. But because it's psychological, it's not as simple as biological compensation, biological homeostasis. It's a compound of many, many different things. And it sums it up in the form of a symbol which appears to be paradoxical. So don't be afraid. The fear is to get your attention. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth saying that right years ago, when we first met, um, I, I told you a dream that I had about a zombie. And this is exactly the theory that you used to help me decipher what that dream was about. 
yeah. and, it was, and it was exactly the same stuff as you're discussing today. And to not, not, going, not going into too many details, something that I noticed was the, the image of a zombie that presented in my personal dream was connected to a piece of fictional media. I was enormously surrounded in, I'd immersed myself in it. But yeah. upon understanding what you were, you know, the, the, the meaning, I guess, to the degree that I did behind why that symbol was appearing in my dreams, my fascination and you could say kind of non-clinically obsession with the fictional media dropped down and that's not not to say oh, i don't like it or i hate it or anything like that it's just no completely organically libido was withdrawn and it felt like i was more alive if you'll pardon the pun so it, do, it, it does work and you're you're said, you, you are a very different person not deep down deep down who you are is coming through and it's a wonderful thing to have shared that with you actually your, your individuation and growth as a process it's, it's been a privilege for paul and i to to be a part of that in a broad sense your victory of course but you are not the same person that you were in terms of how you appear to others and anyone who's watching these videos over the just over two years we've been doing them will see that change and many people have commented upon them hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're right when you do the right thing by the psyche everything lines up and when everything li lines up you feel better it's as simple as that and uh, <laughs> yeah but before zomb uh, zombies were popular it was vampires mm -hmm. and then there was a transition it was werewolves and then werewolves became zombies even some filmmakers that i knew would joke about where's the where are the werewolves we've got to have werewolves in this script why well because this particular demographic it was an Asian one, actually. Um, I won't go into any more detail, but they all have work. You've got to have werewolves. Why? No, it, it doesn't make any sense other than it keeps people trapped and, and, and locked down. Now, with, with the, um, the vampire phenomenon, it's very easy to see on the surface that that's uh, a form of sexuality and predation. But there's an undead element as well, isn't there? OK, so now we have the undead element. That there's, a, there's a common factor with, uh, with zombies. Uh, and the movement of blood well wh whether a primitive society and it wouldn't of course knows or doesn't know the significance symbolically of blood for the genome and for the life force and then the necessity of blood and oxygen and everything else that's involved in that for life and to have your libido your life force taken by a parasite a parasitical force which takes you over and makes you become like it means there is something which is behind the symbol which is working really hard to become conscious. And the fact that the, the, the sexuality connected with it shows how fundamental that is. And very often people who are obsessed with vampire movies and their fear they are one, or even become virtually psychotic and imagine that they are, um, it's simply because they are, they are living such a dissociated life away from their instincts and their intended lifespan uh, development trajectory that it is summed up like that in an attempt to solve it. The solution comes in the vampire myths uh, and films very often, certainly in the old ones, and going back to the Hammer stories, for example, very simple stories, not particularly frightening at all, but the elements of the story were, were really good. They were of mythic quality. Um, had to do with who solves the problem. It was usually not the obvious athletic young hero or the, the heroine or whoever, it was usually some old guy who mm. understood what he was up against and understood what to do to bring everything to its proper conclusion. And that's the analog, if you like, with the idea of a wise old man. I, I wouldn't reduce it to that. What I would say is it's, it's the idea of experience and getting experience from somebody who knows a little bit more about the phase of life that we're going through and can help us with, with the right form of adaptation. So the Van Helsing character in the Hammer movies, for example, is a psychopomp, he's not a wise old man, but he's also someone who knows both science and the occult. He knows both and he doesn't see that there's any distinction that's, that's meaningful or worthwhile between the two. They dovetail as a continuum of adaptation. So it's the same with the vampires as it is with the zombies or any of these horror, uh, that kind anyway, a, a sort of a horror genre, slashes of movies are different, you know, it's a, that's a different consideration. But this kind of thing, it's similar. So I would say if you want to understand um, the phenomenon of zombies, look at the psychology behind vampires, they're very, very similar. The compensatory dynamics are identical. And at bottom, when people are afraid of life, 
it comes at you literally in this form. The, the, the zombie who never tires, who keeps coming no matter what you do, but that's the indefatigable instinctive pressure from within to force you to confront what you've done to yourself and then change. And the minute you do, the zombie's gone, the vampire's gone, and you're liberated. Mm -hmm. Would you also include ghosts in that camp as well, as an imago? They can be. I think it depends uh, on the narrative. Uh, and how the narrative works through. I mean, the, I, I think that we tend to lump together things like ghosts, uh, poltergeists, and, uh, and other paranormal phenomena, um, other parapsychological phenomena like um, clairvoyance, retrocognition, precognition. They all get lumped together because it's such a complicated uh, situation. What we then do is collapse it and we say, that is precognition, that is a ghost, that is a whatever. Whereas if we consider it, and I know you, you're very familiar with this, with the notion of it being a field mm -hmm. that collapses into resolution that we can absorb and work with, then not only is it less threatening, it becomes more interesting because we can see how the deep structure energy and information is shifting in real time into one form of representation and another, and it's moving around. But it will respond if we approach to it in the right way. Ghosts do. So-called ghosts respond when they're genuine and they're not, you know, psychiatric hallucinations, they respond to our approach to them in an effort to understand what they are. But if we insist on calling them, say, spirits of the dead or, or, or whatever, that's a collapsed waveform that the ego resonates with with respect to the culture. And the psyche says, no, nope, that's not what I mean. But if you insist that you're going to have more of a haunting, we'll, we'll just we'll just wrap this up until <laughs> you see you're asking the wrong question. Uh, and there's a similar analogy there with the, the Grail Castle and, and the question raised of the Grail Knights. If you get it wrong, there are consequences. And if you get it right, everything works. And the deep structure between both the, the, uh, the mythic representation of the Grail Castle and the Grail question, and then of zombies, vampires and ghosts and whatever, the deep structure of that is that you must approach the psyche in the right way. And the way to do that is to set the ego aside it's very difficult to do because of the inertia attached to the ego's fixed positions. It insists on interpreting the inner world as if it's the outer world. And then it insists on uh, internally projecting a model of understanding whether that's uh, reductive science, philosophy, or whatever it might be. Maybe, it, maybe it's Jungian psychology. It's like, oh, there's the animal, there's the shadow, there's the whatever. They're not there. They're not there unless it presents in that form and, and basically presents in such a way as that it, you, 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 you cannot argue with it. That's what it is. At that point, you accept it. But if we insist on internally projecting, it's, it's chaos. And it takes ages and ages and ages to work that through, whilst the inertia of the ego insists on generating more and more fantasies. This is why Jungian analysis takes so long. And a lot of Jungians like that because, of course, it's good for them if it takes a long time. so many questions on this but, <laughs> but but i love this stuff so much based on the time i think it's probably best to return back to the, to the yes, dialogue. Go ahead. sweet if you've got any time at the end i've got loads of questions for you sure no problem you read the you read to the end didn't you yes i did yeah cool okay. actually about turning um if you just scroll back up james please thank you uh, and unpack its meaning into an individual self-concept that's the important thing when meaning is accessed and unpacks itself, then the ego changes and it often doesn't realize why it's changed. And, and that's the magic moment we want because there's less inertia. Um, the main representation within consciousness is, is a sense of contentment, but also of goal-directed activation. We want to act in the world. And at that point, no more self-analysis. It's all about doing. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Someone, so for context, someone else then came in and joined in with the dialectic and they, they said, I'll have to take a closer look at that since it's bringing up recollections in my own context. I remember when the first season of The Walking Dead came out in late 2010. My best friend and friend group loved the show, but I quickly lost interest after the first season. My best friend in particular seemed to identify with it strongly, 
It's interesting because before that, I too was into the zombie craze, mostly through video games. It seems my interests might have been changing at the time, which was followed by a clash in the social group and loss of all those friendships. I'd been studying my anima the first time around before I knew what an anima was. You've got a relatively short response, Steve. We'll just read it out here. Yeah. Um, so, so um, oh, go ahead, James. Were you going to read oh, it? So, yeah, I was, I was just going to read out just because it's only a couple, couple of lines. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, you said an appreciation of superpositioning allows you to move away from a collapsed ego waveform that becomes fascinated, quote unquote, by its own reduced state. Yeah, and there's a lot in there. Yeah, there's a huge amount in that one sentence. So I don't, I don't know how we can begin even unpacking it, but there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, I, I think basically uh, we, we could do it fairly directly and say that superpositioning refers to the fact that the same information will exist in many different states simultaneously and we won't be aware of most of them. But that doesn't mean that the information isn't there, it is. And when we talk about collapse, we mean that it resolves into a representation that can be experienced potentially or not, but it's still there. And when we increase consciousness, we increase the, diff the amount of different representational systems that we can perceive this information in. Now that might seem abstract, it's not at all. For example, if somebody has uh, an anxiety state and they simultaneously have a physical set of symptoms, whether it's irritable bowel, paresthesia, whatever it might be, that's the same information in two different kinds of states, one more psychological, one more psychophysiological. It's the same information. Uh, a medic may come along and focus only on the physical symptoms. So that's one collapse of the waveform that includes the other. Uh, a psychologist may focus only on the psychological factors and miss the physiology. And then there's the behavioral element and so many other different dimensions in broad terms, but it's the same information. So when we're dealing with something like what this, this, um, this person mentioned, we have the context of their life within which the same information is appearing in video games, it's appearing in his psyche, it's appearing uh, in his uh, interpersonal relationships, it's probably appearing in his body, his anxiety symptoms, and it's the same thing fundamentally that collapses into uh, a certain kind of representation. Now that can make it seem like, how the hell do I solve this? And that's when different people come in, as I said before, you might get medics and counsellors or whatever, trying to fiddle with different parts of that person's life. Meanwhile, they're still distressed because none of these reductive and fractured levels of appreciation of what's going on is going to help the whole thing sort itself out. So if, though, we can become conscious sufficiently to be able to say this is the same phenomenon, and if I can solve the symbolic meaning of this information, I actually transduce it from being a wide field representation into something that can come into my awareness and unpack its meaning. Once meaning is unpacked, then the purpose of the symptoms is gone. That means no symptoms. That means better adaptation. Now, it is that simple in broad terms. When it comes to actually doing it, of course, it's nuanced and it depends upon the individual, but that's what we need to do. As soon as we fracture into, into separate levels of analysis, description, and explanation, we lose the totality of that which we are facing, which is fundamentally simple. Cool. So I joined in with the dialectic there, just to highlight the significance of these insights from Steve is unmatched by anyone else in the field, completely organic, and the antidote to fantasy that thousands upon thousands have been entrapped within. And that was, that was a sincere comment that I felt obliged to make at that time. Yeah, that's very sure. kind. Yeah, I mean, I came back um, and I, I mentioned the term fascination because that's an old term for a hypnotic trance. This, this is really, go, really old. This goes right back. And there's such a lot in that term because fascination, if you look at somebody who's fascinated with something, their attention is completely upon it. Other things are filtered out. So the idea of fascination within, to be fascinated with something going on on the inside, means effectively that your ego, your consciousness, collapses around the object of that which we are fascinated with within. And it may not actually be an object, it may be part of us subjectively, such as the rhetoric of a complex, or a holding space fantasy, which is absorbing our energy and libido, but we become fascinated with it. And that's where the inertia comes from that resists change. 
the ego will not shift. And this is the, one of the major problems with fantasy is that it generates that state. So I say that the repetition compulsion is fascination. The repeating of it is fascination. The ability to transduce or unpack meaning, as we were saying just before, into the self-concept is a bandwidth issue. In other words, the self-concept can only take so much, which is why symbols as such remain unconscious even when engaged with. And by conscious, I mean ego conscious. You can unpack the meaning of, a, of a, a symbol to the extent that it affects us without us being conscious of it in a normal ego way. And this is another problem uh, with people who follow Jung, that they think that they can simply unpack the unconscious into consciousness uh, as if it would fit. And if it doesn't fit, then you fold it like origami and eventually you, you can squash it all. It doesn't. It doesn't work that way at all. Consciousness is limited and we have to accept that. It's limited for good adaptive reasons. If it were too extensive, the energy cost would be enormous. Uh, and not only that, we'd probably not survive very long because we would be too internally focused with the amount of background chatter and noise and pressure that's coming from within. So it has to be limited in order to be adapted, but that does not mean that it cannot be transduced or converted into a form that brings about change. And that's superpositioning again. The ego only has to do enough to bring this superpositioning consciousness into a resonant state, a resonant state that's active at different levels simultaneously. So the unconscious as a broad concept starts to regulate itself. The different layers of immediate consciousness likewise start to regulate itself. And then the ego is left free of conflict and instinctive pressure to focus on outer adaptation whilst everything else unpacks and we feel better. But what do these, uh, these people who follow Jung these days want to do? You have to assimilate and integrate the unconscious. You can't do it. It's impossible. It's a stupid idea. And it's a negative also suggestion that will generate fantasy because these people fantasize that they're doing it. They're not. They're actually collapsing their ego around a fantasy. And what that will mean is that the instincts will push even harder. That means they need more fantasy. Jungians do this all the time. Let's have some more fantasy. Let's find another myth. Another one, another one, another one. More and more fantasy. Fantasy is great. Meanwhile, what happens is that we don't develop. We don't actualize in the world. We don't achieve anything. And then the depression starts to catch up. Then the libido starts to be pulled away. And then there's an attempt to stop that. And that turns into OCD, for example, or procrastination or any of these other buzzwords that are thrown around by internet gurus very unhelpfully. So... Understanding that the psyche communicates on its own terms, in its own way, and that we don't have to consciously integrate everything, but only enough to allow us to do what we need to do in the outside world and everything else will align. That's an insight. People really need to grasp that because it is real. And, you know, ordinary people with no psychological education or information grasp this and they change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They live more authentic lives. There are a lot of these people who are covered in philosophy, absolutely drowning in the fantasies of philosophy or of uh, Jungian psychology or whatever it might be, or internet guru crap. If I can make a quick comment on the Jungian stuff, because you've, you've reminded me there. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure it's an ion, actually. Um, the definition of integration of contents of the unconscious by Jung, and then obviously by downstream Jungians, and inflation are defined in exactly the same way. Yeah. Exactly the same way. Contents within the self rush into yeah. the egg. So there's no base distinction between them. So I wonder if the trickster is playing a joke on some of these Jungians and perhaps Jung himself. I mean, it, it was Ion, which we've spoken about on the channel before. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. Biologically, it's obviously impossible. And it defeats the point of having an unconscious in the first place. It's like we, we've been born to live in a video game and that's that's completely silly so i agree with everything that you're saying steve yeah yeah um anybody who wants a, a really good background on on carl jung from an autobiography deirdre burr's book is probably the best there is it's comprehensive beyond belief in terms of the references and uh, the sources that are in there from the family as well and from others and access to papers that people don't normally get access to uh, once you've got that, and then if you look at Jung's work, you can make your own mind up 
Agreed. It's a fantastic book. It's a fantastic, fantastic book. So yeah, fascination is an old term for a hypnotic trance. The repetition compulsion is fascination. The ability to transduce or unpack meaning into the self-concept is a bandwidth issue, as I've just explained, which is why symbols remain unconscious, even when engaged with. They have to. If, if a symbol is no longer unconscious, it is no longer a symbol. Even Jung would agree with that. He would say it's become a sign at that point. Meaning is a higher order phase state of consciousness precisely because it isn't cognition or the attachment of affect. It is understanding that comes from alignment, as I've just been explaining, and the certainty of the necessity for action. Again, as I've just explained, proof of concept comes from the fixation of reduction into the distraction of banality you see in those played with by their trickster function and those whose consciousness is polarized by affective identification. Now, I'll, I'll start with the end there. When we become polarized by affective identification, affect is a kind, a qualia of consciousness, which is not the same as normal rational ego cognition. It's phylogenetically older. It's it's the um, Yak Pangsep and Mark Solms. And they did fantastic work on this and demonstrating this is absolutely real. That this is a form of independent consciousness to cognition. It's upstream of cognition. It's quicker than it, it happens before it. And it influences our normal ego consciousness for sure but the way that it influences us is that we are thrown into a state because affect consciousness is a state it, it's it, we feel it viscerally we, we feel it what we call emotionally but what happens is that ego consciousness is lowered is attenuated and that's the problem because without ego consciousness we can't interpret the, the affect sorry ego cognition consciousness we cannot interpret and integrate affect we're merely in a state a state of emotion or affect now there may be uh, accompanying that representational images that emerge from the unconscious they can be very valuable there may be movements or sensations in the body and there may be synchronicities that just suddenly happen at the right moment all of these things are part of a field phenomenon so we do not want to reduce consciousness we want one that spreads itself out laterally like a receiving dish and receives everything it possibly can in that moment but those um, psychotherapies for example that latch on to the the affect become inflated by the affect but don't translate it and it doesn't go anywhere and they're left with the the ego later not really understanding what happened or you're left with an ego which identifies with affect states to the extent that it insists that I must have more of this. And we get into the repetition compulsion of I need more emotion. I need more affect. I need to feel this, feel that. And of course, that can just go into a state of addiction using substances or whatever. So neither cognition nor affect on their own deliver meaning. Meaning is a third phase shift, phase state of consciousness. And that is deep. That's very deep. But we use the term transcendent or transpersonal, which suggests elevation, to describe the effect, the effect of being in that state. And in order to get to that, you need to glimpse the meta instincts. And to do that, you have to get beyond even emotion, even affect. And the, the banality element uh, brings about the trickster is usually where a person is being too cognitive and is motivated by trying to play cognitive games and manipulate other people or themselves. And it brings about that banal relationship to life, which is devoid of a relationship even to feeling. That's separated, that's gone. So they don't even get the affect. They get gratification very often out of manipulating people. But the power of the word and the manipulation of cognition is the most important thing to them. The trickster will just utilize that and they trick themselves. So that, that's what was meant by the, the end part of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it's probably worthwhile if anyone watching this hasn't seen it yet our video on synchronicity that we did a couple of weeks ago or so because you talk a lot in there about those phase states of consciousness and we show diagrams on that including how it all ties in with the trickster as well yeah that's, that's important probably worth, worthwhile saying but okay let's someone comes in after your post and asks is there an effective way to communicate that meaning outside of oneself i'd imagine that it could collapse back down into symbols rather quickly since it would likely be impossible to impart something with such a high bandwidth. You responded, Steve. Yeah. 
Yeah, so basically, um, I really appreciated the question, but it shows how difficult it is to overcome the inertia of a normal ego's way of understanding things. So in effect, I have to start with the first two lines in repeating myself, which I, I won't do again. But I'll go on about the zombies here. The zombie narrative gained some collective traction back in the late 90s as it was appearing in the psyches of our patients with increased amplitude. It'd been there before, but it was, it was mainly vampires. Back in the 80s, it was vampires. Mm -hmm. It was present before that, but it gathered resonance with cultural representations. I was saying before, the culture starts to inform the ego about what it should fantasize about and therefore what it internally projects and therefore what the deep structure complexes absorb as an impression of the ego to reflect back to it. The inertia to understanding it came and still comes from a, a complete collapse into fascination, going back to what I was saying before, with the narrative. In other words, we get hypnotized by it, whether that's a dream, a fantasy or a cultural representation. Just as it did and still does with other so-called horror genres, and here I mentioned vampires, slasher movies, etc. All of these representations remain collapsed level state representations insofar as they remain fantasy representations of information properly superpositioned and related to otherwise, in other words, related to in a different way. And again, we, we've discussed that just before. I mentioned here that we're doing a video series. This is a part of that. That will cover it. And can I ask you just a quick question on this top bit there? So yep. you said this was vampires in the 80s and then late 90s zombies come along. Mm. Um, I'm, unless I've been living under a rock, I'm, I'm not aware of vampires being popular at all with, say, um, Gen Z, um, except for Twilight. And that's overtly sexual in its yep. undertones. Yeah. Um, zombies definitely were, uh, beginning probably around 2009, 2010, were absolutely everywhere. I think the, the, um, one of the guys who asked the question said The Walking Dead, that was huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, loads so. of video games. Remember, like, every single video game that was coming out had some kind of zombie element in it. Yeah. So do, do you think, if I'm mostly contrasting, I guess, between the 80s and the 90s, but then this guess, zombie build-up, is there a reason why one Imago would be more popular in one decade rather than the others. So this is, is cultural because um, before the internet, the exposure to this kind of imagery was very limited. And for a generation that's never not had the internet, it's probably hard to appreciate just how limited it was. Mm -hmm. And, and zomb uh, zombies were known, but the, the high water horror genre was vampires, followed by Frankenstein, actually. And Frankenstein's a kind of zombie, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Uh, and if you go right back to the beginning of um, the use of cinema, actually, right back to the, um, the early 1900s, you, you see these elements start to come through because they were present in literature. Mm -hmm. so yeah, what, Nos, what, Nosferatu is the famous yeah, vampire. Nosferatu, yeah. Uh, of course, in the, in the 50s, 60s and up to the mid 70s, it was the hammer horror genre that was the main one. And I say by today's standards, they're not frightening at all. But what made them scary was, I think, is the, the, the same way that if, if we were to go to see an original performance of Shakespeare, by original, I, I mean not interpreted in a present sense, say at the Globe Theatre in London, and it's performed as it was in the 16th century, and then somebody says there's no special effects, where's the CGI? Mm -hmm. right? But the, the, the people who absorb themselves with the presentation of the story means that they resonated a deep structure with the meaning of the story. Therefore, the superficial representation of it means less. So although the Hammer Horror movies are very low budget by today's standards and the special effects are not good, if you can link with the meaning of it, suddenly the impact is very, very deep and you do actually have a mythic representation of those forces which are trying to come through. But the way that the culture's messed with things is that the people now want to be satiated with CGI. And we all know it's CGI. And we start to concentrate on it being CGI. And we start to criticize the CGI. And it doesn't deliver. It doesn't deliver meaning. So we've, what, how, what do we do? Oh, repetition compulsion, more CGI, more CGI. I'm after something. You can only give me this through more CGI. No, no, less, less, less. Go watch Shakespeare at the Globe Theatre. Mm -hmm. Watch a Hammer Horror movie from within. Not from within your ego, but from deep within. Open up and allow that to, to go in. And you'll find the deep structure, even with something that appears by today's standards to be so crass as a Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing movie. It's all in there. So to return back to what you're saying then, 
Now, vampires were definitely more popular and then gradually that morphed. And there were probably commercial reasons for that. And the, the, there is a similarity, of course, as I say, between vampires and zombies and Frankenstein at one level, even werewolves. You can see that there's a connection there. And if you're into depth psychology, you have to say, what is the connection that is not obvious on the surface that links all of these together? And that connection isn't locked within state of a genre within a film um, uh, or a narr you know, novel narrative or anything like that. It's to do with the psyche. The psyche is the ultimate context because the psyche itself expresses the genome and the collective fields that we have as human beings between ourselves. So that's where we go to understand everything. Jung would agree with that. I think you finished this paragraph, I think. Did I, did I finish it? Or maybe not. Oh, yes, I have done, yes, yeah. So if something is superposition that exists as represented information, again, we were saying this earlier, but just to, just to cover it again, in more than one state, these states organize into the systems levels which represent them. The waveform of information then takes on, but may not be limited to, the systems levels it occupies. We are saying this earlier about how psychological and biological information is essentially the same thing, but appears officially to be different. Mm -hmm. This is the collapse of the waveform. However, as interactive observers, we're interacting with our observations. The collapse is a product of both our observation and our resonant field with the information. So we, we cause the information to collapse into the level that we look at it at. If we're medics, we, we're concentrating on biology, so we collapse it into medicine. For psychologists, we collapse it into that. They're both reductionisms. But it's also part of our own resonance with it. There will be an effect, which will be a field phenomenon. This is really marked with psychiatrists and psychologists, for example. And it's, it's part of the problem of being in one of those professions when they're exposed to things that their model only really touches to, at best, the upper middle level of depth, because the rest of that depth is there and it will pull and it will start to provide a gravitational attraction to them to be pulled into a state where they have to begin to deal with that that's coming through. And Jung talked about this as psychological infection. But you could see it, for example, with Jung, that he dealt with his um, exposure to people who were insane, ultimately by becoming insane himself, but firstly by finding, without looking, because it found him, internal correlates with insanity that were based on the influence that his parents brought into his life, his mother, and all of the superstitions uh, and uh, beliefs in occultism that she had, and then his father's superstitions, I'll call them that, in this context, to do with his beliefs about Christianity and religion broadly. So all of that was there latently. And when Jung was exposed to this material, then that just rushed up from within to meet it. And it formed an activation chain. And uh, Jung had to generate a fantasy system to protect himself, which became his personal myth. And it became his form of psychology. But that generated an inertia that lasted for decades. Controversial. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah, but it still lives on today, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. End with Carl Gustav Jung. Yeah. However, as interactive observers, the collapse is a product of both our observation and our resonant field with that information. Hence, our ego conscious observation only detects a part of the waveform as such. It may be resonant with what we psychoreductively call the unconscious. Now, the reason I say psychoreductively is that when psychological therapists and academics talk about an unconscious what they really mean is non-immediate ego awareness consciousness mm -hmm. and so be active within us outside of our state-bound ego consciousness we can become conscious of the unconscious by understanding that the waveform is capable of a superpositional consciousness in relationship with and to the ego in other words, we become more conscious by understanding the unconscious can represent itself in different forms to us. This is what we were discussing earlier about how deep structure complexes form, what symbols are, psychodynamics of projection, transference, and so forth. All of this is superpositioned movements of energy and information. This is the ground state condition for all higher or extended consciousness. Once we know that superpositioning is real, we can step outside of our limitations 
There are varying dynamic representations of the waveform. The easiest to understand is probably, as I said before, mind-body symbolic conversion of symptoms. Another example, though, is true creativity. There is no extended consciousness where the ego relates to the wider waveform only through symbols, including narratives and myths, dreams and fantasies. In order to really get in there, we have to become creative. In other words, we have to produce something in the world which is the manifestation of superpositioned information extrinsically to us, whereas before it was locked within, at least in terms of our ability to, to perceive it. It is in potentia in the world, but it's not released and it pushes for it. That's creativity. It's the urge to make manifest superpositioned information, which has been reduced only to psychology, for example, but it needs to be out in the world. That leads to creativity. Affect or emotional based consciousness is a non cognitive phase state of consciousness that complements cognition, but it can easily collapse into the qualia of effect as a state in itself, as we were saying earlier, without meaning beyond the perception of being in an affective state. Again, as I said earlier, the ego has to be entrained to resolve itself into better resolution of the waveform that exists beyond itself. Otherwise, there's only, as I say, the dreary banality of misapprehending internal projection as being something other than a narcissistic mirror for a collapsed ego. As I was saying earlier, when we look in, we tend to see ourselves first. So a first base problem is that people expect extended consciousness to be analogous with the ego. In other words, the same thing. It's not. Fantasy provides the holding space for testing that belief. We test it within fantasy like a sandbox. Is this real? Is it real? And can I really be this, this bigger mind? You know, is my consciousness somehow universal or is the universe in me? This is the kind of thing you hear people say when inflation and paradoxically collapse, deflation occurs within someone. Unfortunately for most, they don't understand the difference between fantasy and imagination. They are different as, and as different as Carl Gustav Jung and Albert Einstein, as uh, was presented in uh, our last video. So that brings us to the end of that dialectic on Discord. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more that then followed that, but it goes on to lots of different paths. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is interested in, in um, I guess, keeping up to date with all of your daily posts, pretty much, Steve, the yep. hours and hours and hours that you put in there could be a link down below for the discord server yep yeah and they'd be very welcome as well I, I do my absolute best daily to answer as many people as possible and as much depth and, and nuance as possible yeah yeah it's, it's really becoming a proper thriving community it's alive over there so it's really good really good i've really enjoyed today steve um yeah, thank you james yeah um i suppose we could then follow this up with a multitude of different topics but perhaps we should ask the, the audience to comment and see what they'd like to cover next. If you want to say anything or have anything discussed or further explained, leave a comment. That'd be wonderful. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you, everybody. Blessings all. Cheers. See you soon.